Welcome to the Dreaming Machine, the Geek Show's animation podcast. I'm Joe, and today I'm with Amy. Hi, Amy. Hello. So, this is a primer episode, a spoiler-free guide to why you should watch Harley Quinn. So, straight up, so you've seen both series as of the... So, there's two seasons as, as of the time of recording, and you've seen both of them, yeah? Yeah. So this might sound weird. I've seen season two, <laughs> just because of when it happened to be available on TV when I when I discovered it and started watching it. It's a very appropriate series, yeah. considering the fact that getting a solo series for a character who is super popular in the comics, who was originally introduced as a sidekick in an animated series it's it's just kind of circular i guess you could argue so it's kind of coming back around to her roots yeah yeah but she's so much more um she's i think i'm not sure if fleshed out is the right word but she's she, she feels like so much more now as a character than she was back then in all our iterations especially in this one so this is um so it started in 2019 so fairly recent series they they bashed out two seasons of it very quickly. Yeah. Um, Kelly Kuoko, um, who I knew from the Big Bang Theory, and there was another sitcom she was in too. But um, but you know, great comic actress. She's she's the voice of Harley Quinn. I think is it Lake Bell is the voice of the the like key character in it, uh, Poison Ivy. Yeah. So good, so good. And yeah, there's a great voice cast. I guess that the, I mentioned those two are the most like prominent characters, apart from the Joker, of course. <laughs> great voice actors, and it's it started off on um, I think it was originally shown on like DC's um like own like streaming service like in the US, and then it Channel Four E Four picked it up in the UK. And they did a pretty lousy job of... They did some promotion initially, but then it was really hard to find, and I don't think they talked about it enough. And I was, I was was today, I was just going to say that it's a great show, and people should check it out, as long as they have the tolerance for like, the swearing and violence in it and everything. But I think you were going to give a warning. It's definitely not a show... It's definitely not a show that, that you probably want your younger children watching. <laughs> Your younger children just shouldn't watch this, I think, as I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So I will say you might want to stick with it a bit. So at the very start of the show, they do seem to be laying that sort of thing on a little bit thick. It's like... So it's like they've watched like a bunch of, a bunch of adult swim shows like The Venture Brothers. Mm. And they're like, ooh, ooh, we want to do that. We want to be like really edgy like that, and like have all have all like the violence and the swearing and ha, ah, check out how. And it feels like they overdo it a bit, like overselling it in the first couple of episodes. It's when that tones down a bit, and they settle more into the stuff with really good actual dialogue for all the characters um like good writing fantastic performances and it relies less on the the extreme sort of violence and and everyone swearing all the time and like that that fades more into the background and it focuses more on delivering really good storytelling and a lot of good like a lot of good humor all the time. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say that because I think that's kind of the experience I had actually. So I, I think um, I somehow, despite kind of getting in, picking up properly later around the second season, I did manage to see season episode one of season one, and I still quite enjoyed it. But I thought it was relatively like inessential, and I wasn't going to go out my way to find it, kind of thing. And I remember chatting yeah. to you and Rob about it yourself and Rob and. You both said, "Oh no, it gets really, really good." <laughs> so I ended up it does, like yeah. pop, when I saw season two advertised, I then probably got into it and really enjoyed it, like all the way through. And the swearing season two is fantastic. Yeah, and I mean, I would say that the 
the swearing is like kind of joyous. Like I, I do really like the way like Kelly Kuroko like um just cusses and like and and just storms around like do- really dominating with a character is like really entertaining. So that is it... okay. Okay, so can I just check? We are just we are just uh like this is gonna have like an eighteen rating on it. This this primer, right? Because of because of the the show we're we're marketing to people. Uh yeah, I think it, I, I think people definitely fucking want that. fantastic. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, no, honestly, yeah, like the amount it ends up with is probably the amount that I use in general conversation <laughs> most of the time when I'm not recording like an all ages podcast. Yeah. I, I do like how uh, how sometimes it's actually used uh, it it's actually used quite effectively as part of like as a narrative device as, as well when when it comes to certain characters uh, like Doctor Psycho. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I I can say it. Yeah. I I can say it because I'm a woman. The cunt guy. <laughs> Yeah, this definitely has an 18 rating on it. Please continue. Mm. <laughs> yeah, no. I do like how, like, the show, yeah, once it finds its footing, like, it does use that more, you know, the, 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 actual, the actual stuff like that isn't just done for gratuitous effect. It's just done as, you know, a thing regular people do in their daily lives that we all, we all do. And it's 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 made a lot of more of a big deal of in like media in a think of the children way, but we all talk like that. Yeah, I th- I think like um yeah, I just wanted to me- I know it seems weird to focus on the swearing, but I just wanted to mention that it is the characters are great and the storytelling is great, but also it is like you see there's other shows like that do are really gratuitous that I don't like, but this one. It's kind of like really cathartic and enjoyable. Like, yeah, <laughs> weird. Yeah, like, yeah. Just the, the the joy with which they they cuss and they do violence and the like irreverence of it and the humor of it and stuff. It it, it just seemed to it, that there was an enjoyment in that, even though this great storytelling and the characters are great too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, on the characters. There, there are so many good characters in the show. It's obviously Ivy and Harley, brilliant. Their performance is fantastic. Ivy is just the perfect, perfect straight man to Harley. Mm. And all of their interactions are just an absolute blessing. I, I love it. Every, every moment I'm watching those two interact. I mean, what I liked as well is about um, Poison Ivy's character is, at first, she is a good straight man to Harley, but I was worried that's all she would be. And then there's so much more. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so they, they really... The depth of their interactions. Yeah, no, 100%. So um, so all these set, there's quite a big ensemble cast, even though it's... it's yes, exactly. Harley. That's what I was going to get into. And yeah. Absolute, absolute show stealer in so many episodes. Clayface. Uh, I believe it was. I believe now. Who was it who said that? Uh, yeah, that the most important decision with Clayface w- was not t- merely to make him an actor, but to make him a thespian. <laughs> and it is. Uh, Clayface is a- any episode where Clayface is getting so perfectly deeply into a role is easily he just steals the show. Clayface is fantastic. Um, I think B- Bane, like on the villain side, I think Bane really stands out for me. Yeah, no, this Bane is wonderful because they've taken all the memes. And condense that into being the Bane character. And, oh, it, it's just so good. I just, I just, 
I, before I saw the show, I didn't realize in my life I needed to see Bane struggle with a coffee machine at a meeting of the villain. <laughs> like, I, I didn't realize that was the thing I needed to see, but apparently it was. Um, he or de- be stuck on a little folding metal chair <laughs> while, while all the rest of them get comfy chairs. I mean, I think with all these characters, um, the side characters and the the, the the typical, the characters are typically villains in the comics. Um, it is fair to say they go for the sillier, like funnier, like versions, versions of them, basically. Oh, yeah. And to great effect. I mean, even like when they go a bit darker, like uh, Commissioner Gordon is is a uh, is still kind of funny. <laughs> like, he's so it, they really like they really double down on his like beaten down cop persona side of his oh, character so heavily. And it's kind of sad and bittersweet, but kind of funny, like how ridiculously downbeat he is, <laughs> and and all the again, it do. reminds me. It reminds me a lot. I do think they were probably quite heavily inspired by shows like The Venture Brothers. Have you seen that? Um, I have not. You absolutely should see it. It's a fantastic show. Mm. Uh, another adult one that we should probably uh, we should probably actually record an episode on in case anyone's been hiding under a rock for the past. Ooh, I feel old now. Uh, it's a long time that show's been going. Venture Brothers fans generally have had to wait like three years between seasons. Wow. <laughs> but yeah, it's because that show took the whole thing of sort of like the boy adventurer cartoon trope and it's like, what happens when that person's like a middle-aged bloke with, with a lot of childhood <laughs> trauma? Um, yeah, and I think there's quite a bit of <laughs> quite a bit of that in uh, in in this uh, in this Gordon. Yeah, it's weird how like when you go that dark, it makes it funnier. It, 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 uh, that's not how it should really work, but it somehow it does. Um, yeah, definitely. So I think um, I mean, there's also a couple of um, moments when so it's kind of. Um, so what's really good is like it kind of breaks out from the formula. You might think it settles into what the, it is going to settle into from at the start, which is good. So he's definitely worth sticking with. And also, they do little breakaway like gags and things sometimes that work really well. And without spoiling it, um, there's a great like comment on like certain like internet like fandom like in one of as a cold open. <laughs> I know exactly which cold open you mean. I, I, yeah, and it's like it's perfect. <laughs> it's just it's a perfect summation. Um, so there's like this kind of um, there's a story going all the way through, of course, and and the story all connects up with each other, which I quite like. But also, so that, you, know, you have individual escapades, of course, but there's still a narrative drive throughout. But it will. And like, the um, first season has yeah. consequences that are being felt right through season two. Yeah, and I think that's needed. So like, you have this humor and you have these silly but really fun personas, but there's still like a narrative impetus to everything that's happening and things change. Also, you know who we still didn't talk about? Mm-hmm. We we still didn't talk about the person with the greatest superpower <laughs> in all of Gotham. <laughs> Kite Man. Kite Man. Yeah, Kite Man's a standout, is it? Kite Man's just a normal <laughs> dude. He's like thrown into the superhero world. You you don't <laughs> expect Kite Man to, to to like when he's first introduced, you're like, oh silly throwaway gag character for one joke. And then Yeah. And then that goes places. <laughs> Oh, it goes to some places. But I mean, you can go places when you have a kite. I, <laughs> I think, like, if you're listening to this and you haven't seen it, I think um, if the Kite Man is an inherently funny concept to you, <laughs> without us even having to say more, you should definitely watch the show. I, I think you'll you'll totally be on board with it, it's fair to say. 
Um, yeah, th- it's things like that. It- it's really funny. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like um, I kind of love stuff like that. Like I read um Squirrel Girl comics, and they've got like a superhero called Koi Boy. Like they've got like other animal chipmunk hunk, like other animal based like superheroes who are like kind of useless, but like really endearing. <laughs> And try their best, but God bless them, you know. Anyway, I digress. So yeah, it's um stick. So yeah, you've got to have the high tolerance for the kind of adult content, and it is definitely adult content. But you'll be surprised and probably quite addicted to it as you go through it. I think if you stick with it, I think that's fair summation. Any other final thoughts, Amy? Ah, uh, not really. I think. Absolutely, it's a show worth watching. Um, if you are wondering if it may have a certain a certain payoff, I would I would definitely encourage you to stick with the show. Um, <laughs> I'm sure anyone familiar with me will have an idea what I'm talking about. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we should... Okay, that's a good place to end it. I think that's good. Yeah, definitely check it out. Excellent. Let us know what you think. Let us know your theories about the future of the series. And many thanks, Amy. Mm. Uh, take care, everyone. Bye-bye now.